Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing perfect fields. Okay, so, we're actually in the process of discussing non-perfect fields now, which are these fields in which we cannot conclude that theorem 1 is true. We cannot conclude that if we have an irreducible polynomial in the ring of polynomials over a non-perfect field that it is necessarily separable. Okay, there are going to be some irreducible polynomials which, if you take their derivative, you get zero, and therefore, of course, this derivative and the polynomial are not relatively prime, and therefore they are not separable. Uh, well, the polynomial is not separable, instead it's inseparable. Okay, what I want to now discuss is the fact that you can always get a very much so related polynomial to your original one, in this case, uh, that um, will be separable. Okay, and I want to stress one thing that is really important here, that in most cases, for most of the irreducible polynomials here, the derivative will not be equal to zero, and you will be absolutely fine. You will be able to conclude as normal that p of x and the derivative of p of x are relatively prime, and therefore that p of x is separable. Okay, but it's just not for all irreducible polynomials anymore that you can conclude that. For some of them, this annoying thing happens that the derivative is actually equal to zero, despite the fact that the polynomial is irreducible, because without the fact that the Frobenius endomorphism is bijective, we can't prove that the derivative of an irreducible polynomial is actually uh, non-zero, and indeed it's not true in an arbitrary non-perfect field anymore, okay? And therefore, it does end up that these polynomials are inseparable. Okay, right, so we're going to just talk about those, not all irreducible polynomials. So we are talking about irreducible polynomials which have a derivative equal to zero in these rings of polynomials over a non-perfect field. And these can only exist if we're talking about a ring of polynomials over a non-perfect field. If you're talking about a ring of polynomials over a perfect field, they don't exist. Okay, all irreducible polynomials have derivative non-zero. Okay, right, uh, so let's now do this. So if p of x has derivative equal to zero, then that tells us something about what p of x looks like. It tells us that p of x is going to look like this. Okay, and firstly, because it's irreducible, we also know it's got degree greater than or equal to one, so it's not just a constant polynomial. So it might have a constant term, p0, then it might have p1, x to the power of alpha 1, let's say, plus p2, x to the power of alpha 2, plus all the way up to p, let's say, m, x to the alpha m, where these alphas are just the powers of x that we've got here. Okay, so alpha 1 is just the smallest power, alpha 2, etc. They're just going up. So they're all just natural numbers. So the alpha i's are just natural numbers here. Okay, right. And what do we know about the alpha i's? We know that they are all multiples of p. Okay, so uh, they are all some multiple of p, otherwise the derivative would not be equal to zero. The only way that you can get the derivative of some uh, degree greater than or equal to one polynomial in a ring of polynomials over a field of characteristic p to equal zero is if all of the non-zero coefficients that are in front of powers of x are in front of powers of x with an index that is a multiple of p. Okay, because then when you diff... I shouldn't say differentiate, when you take the derivative, uh, you will multiply by the old power, and of course that old power is going to be equal to zero because it's a multiple of p. Okay? Right, uh, so here is our polynomial, and what I can conclude then is that all of these, all of these alpha i's, they are something mi times p. Now note, it might be the case that some of them have actually a larger power of p in them, i.e. when you take that irreducible factorization in the natural numbers, you might get larger powers of p appearing in here if you take that prime factorization. Okay, so uh, all we, all I'm saying here is that every single one of them has to have a power of p in it. Okay, right. So now, how am I going to uh, modify this? Well, it's best for me to show you how I'm going to modify this rather than try and tell you how I'm going to modify it because it it's quite complicated to actually describe it, but it's quite easy to show what we're doing here, and you'll get the message by me showing you. So I think show not tell is the best uh, approach here. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all of these powers here, alpha 1, and I'm just going to highlight them in. So I'll go through all of these powers, alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha m here, okay, and 
I'm going to look at how large is the power of p in their prime factorization. And of course, you could call that an irreducible factorization, but we've been working with irreducible factorizations in the natural numbers for years as children and been calling them prime factorizations. So I'm going to call them prime factorizations uh, in the natural numbers because uh, that's what we've been calling them for years. So you take the prime factorizations of these natural numbers here, you'll get some power of p appearing. At the very least, you'll get p to the power of 1 in all of them. Okay, but what if it's the case that actually in all of them you have p appearing to a higher power? What if it's the case that in all of them you have p appearing to the power of 3, at, at least in all of them? That's going to be interesting, and what I want you to do is I want you to find the smallest, sorry, not the smallest, the largest power of p that appears in all of them, and call this p to the power of k. So I'm saying go through all of these, alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n, factor them into their prime factorizations and see what power of p appears in all of them. And they can all have different powers of p. I want you to find me the greatest power of p that is in all of them, i.e. Uh, this is the biggest power of p that's in all of them, i.e. there's one of these that just has this and all the others might have a little bit higher than that, okay? And then you can't go any higher because if you went any higher you go past one of them. Okay, so you find this, and this is the largest power of p that is common to all of them. And what I mean, I'll stress this again, is if you go through all of these, you'll find p to the power of k in their prime factorizations, and in one of them, that will be the highest power of p in its prime factorization. Okay, I, you couldn't have made this p k plus 1 because that wouldn't have appeared in the prime factorization of one. So you find the highest power of p that appears in the prime factorization of all of these powers, alpha 1, one, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha m here. Okay, now here's the great trick. What you can do is you can then write p of x in a new way. You can write p of x like so, p0 plus p1 times uh, x to the power of p to the k to the power of beta 1 plus, and then you go on, so I'll put in p2 as well, p2 times x to the power of pk uh, to the power of beta 2 here, and then it will go on, and I'll try and fit this all in, plus pm x to the power, whoops, put in the bracket, x to the power of p to the k um, to the power of beta m here. Okay, like so. And understand how much the meaning has changed here. Okay, this was an actual polynomial in the ring of polynomials over our non-perfect field. The additions were the symbolic additions. You know, the powers were just placeholders. You'd put coefficients in front of the powers. It was a cold, hard symbol in that set. Whereas here, the meaning is quite different. This is uh, loads of symbols from here. So you've got these symbols, the x to the power of p to the k. That is a polynomial in the ring of polynomials over uh, the non-perfect field here. But then what you're doing is you're raising it to the power of something, and you're doing that in the ring of polynomials over the field capital F. Okay, so this raising to the power means times this polynomial beta 1 times with itself. Okay, and all of these are equivalent, like so, so I can colour all of these in in green here, and this highlighter is starting to go, but never mind. And then the multiplication now means multiplying these coefficients in the actual ring of polynomials. Okay, these are all just constant polynomials. You can multiply this with what you end up with here, okay? And of course, the additions now are also additions in the uh, ring of polynomials. So all of this has now become operations in the ring of polynomials over the non-perfect field, capital F. Everything's changed its meaning, and if you were to actually work this all out, I want you to get this as the answer. And of course, for that to be the case, I want it to be the case that beta i times p to the power of k is equal to alpha i. Okay, so that when you take these uh, x to the power of p to the k to the power of some beta, you get the x to the power of the alpha, okay, depending on which beta you're using here. Okay, and then uh, you can tell that obviously if you multiplied uh, the constant polynomial here with its x to the power of alpha, you'd guess all of this. Yeah, so the rest of it's quite obvious that if you were to do that, you'd get the correct thing here. Okay, so 
Why is this interesting to do? Well, it allows me to construct a new polynomial. What I'm now going to do is replace the x to the power of p to the k here, just with an x, and I'm going to construct this new polynomial, p of x, and, oh, well, not p of x, it's going to have a new name, so we'll do it down here, actually. It's going to be called p sep, okay, of x, okay, so p subscript sep for separable, because it is, in fact, going to be a separable polynomial, okay, and it's going to have the same coefficients, p0 plus p1, and that's going to be x to the power of beta 1, but different powers now, because we've effectively, in a way, pulled out the x to the power of p to the k, okay, plus, uh, then it will be p2, x to the power of beta 2, plus all the way up to pm, x to the power of beta m, like so. Okay, now, how then to do this a little bit more rigorously? Is this polynomial related to this polynomial here? Well, if you were to evaluate this polynomial at the polynomial x to the power of p to the k, then you would get back the polynomial p of x. So that's how they're related. You can imagine creating the evaluation homomorphism where you evaluate all polynomials at this monomial, which is x to the power of p to the power of k. Okay, and this would be a homomorphism from, of course, uh, the ring of polynomials over the non-perfect field capital F into the ring of polynomials over the non-perfect field capital F. Okay, and it would map this polynomial onto this one, okay? I hope you appreciate that what you do is exactly this. You'd end up substituting in for the x, the x to the power of p to the k, changing the meaning here completely. The additions would all actually become additions. The multiplications of the coefficients would actually become multiplications. The taking to the power would become actual taking to the power. But that's exactly how an evaluation homomorphism at a certain polynomial works. So if you're not familiar with evaluation homomorphisms uh, at polynomials. I have a video on it in the playlist on ring theory, but this does obey the axioms of a ring homomorphism, indeed a ring endomorphism, because the domain and the codomain are the same. Okay, right. Uh, so, this is a very much so related polynomial. Okay, it's got the same coefficients, we've just changed the powers of x by, in a way, pulling out this x to the power of the highest uh, power of p that we could pull out of all of the powers of x. Okay, now the claim is then that this polynomial is separable. Now how am I going to prove that? Well, what I want to prove is that it's still irreducible in the ring of polynomials over the field capital F, and that its derivative is not equal to zero. Okay, so let's start with irreducible. So why is it irreducible? Well, quite simply, let's do a proof by contradiction. Suppose it wasn't irreducible, then I'd be able to write p sep of x as the product of two non-unit polynomials. Okay, so it would be the product of a of x with b of x, where both of these were not units. Okay, so they, it was a non-trivial product making it, basically. And now what I can just do is apply this evaluation homomorphism at this polynomial x to the power of p to the k to both sides. Of course, p sep will be taken on to p of x, so this is when I apply this mapping phi. Okay, and now, because it's a ring homomorphism, I can just say it's going to be phi of this one times phi of this one in the codomain here. Okay, so it'll become a evaluated at x to the power of p to the k times b evaluated at x to the power of p to the k. So now I will have p of x multiplied by two polynomials that are non-units, because if these were non-units before, then when we evaluate them at x to the power of p to the k, that's certainly not going to suddenly make them units, okay? If they weren't constant polynomials before, then evaluating them at x to the power of p to the k is not going to suddenly make them constant polynomials. So they're still going to be not units. So it would imply that p of x was not irre was reducible, sorry, okay, not irreducible, and therefore that's a contradiction because we know that p of x we're assuming is irreducible. Okay, so indeed, hence we have proven that p sep of x must be irreducible in the ring of polynomials over our non-perfect field. In addition, why can I conclude that its derivative is non-zero? Okay, so what allows me to conclude that the derivative of p sep is not equal to zero? Well, that's the fact that I pulled out the highest power of p that was common to all of them, okay? Now, remember what I said. I stress this so much. 
what that would mean I would end up doing is pulling completely all powers of P out of one of these at least, okay? One of them must, for one of these powers, it must have been the case that the highest power of P that it had in its prime factorization was P to the K. If it wasn't that case, then you could have gone higher, okay? You could have found an even larger power of P that was common to all of them. So I must have completely removed all um, powers of P from one of these, i.e. one of these betas must not be a multiple of P, okay? And that then means that when I differentiate this thing, one of these terms is going to remain non-zero, okay? At least one of them. So therefore, the derivative of this is not going to be equal to zero. And I know that if I've got an irreducible polynomial, even in a ring of polynomials over a non-perfect field, and its derivative is non-zero, then I can conclude that these two are relatively prime, and therefore I can conclude that this polynomial is separable. So indeed, this polynomial is going to be separable. So it's a very much so related polynomial, I hope you'll agree, to our original polynomial, which is separable. So you can always take your original polynomial and, in a sense, get rid of this highest power of P that is common to all of the powers of X, okay? Uh, and then that what's left over is going to be separable. So this is the best we can do in a ring of polynomials over a uh, non-perfect field. Now, just to end with then, let me give you a little bit of nomenclature concerning all of this that we've just been discussing. Okay, so firstly, the concept of the separable degree of a polynomial P of X. So we're assuming that our polynomial P of X here is some irreducible polynomial that is inseparable at the moment. Then the separable degree of it is the degree of the PSEP polynomial. So you can construct this PSEP polynomial and of course that will have a degree, that is known as the separable degree of the original polynomial. So we put degree subscript s, and you would call this, as I say, the separable degree of the polynomial p of x. So this is the separable degree. Okay, similarly there is the concept of the inseparable degree of the polynomial p of x. So once again we're assuming p of x is an irreducible polynomial in the ring of polynomials over this non-perfect field uh, that um, can therefore have this PSEP formed for it. The inseparable degree of it, which we denote degree subscript i of this polynomial p of x, called the inseparable degree, so just stick an in in front of that name, okay, is defined to be this p to the power of k, the highest power of p that was common to all of those powers of x in the original polynomial p of x. Okay, that's what's known as the inseparable degree. That's the bit that you need to get rid of in order to make it separable, in order to transform it into PSEP here. Okay, now hopefully it should be obvious that if you multiply these two together, if you multiply the inseparable degree with the separable degree, you will end up with the degree of the original polynomial, okay, because the degree of the original polynomial is the degree of PSEP evaluated at x to the power of p to the k, and that's going to raise the degree of the highest power term by p to the power of k. Therefore, if I multiply these two together, um, you will actually get the degree of the original polynomial. So I'll just write that final equation down, and that'll be a nice place to finish. So the degree of the polynomial p of x is the separable degree of the polynomial p of x times the inseparable degree of the polynomial p of x. Okay, and I hope that that should be reasonably obvious um, just from the fact that, as I say, uh, p of x is just the p-sep evaluated at x to the power of p to the k, and evaluating at x to the power of p to the k will raise the degree of the highest power term um, by um, p to the k, well, by by multiplying it by p to the k. So you need to take the degree originally and multiply it by p to the k. Okay, so uh, with that then we will finish this video on perfect fields.